Every one of us, a belief that we'd lose at least uh, one, possibly even more astronauts uh, during the, the Mercury program. The risks were incredibly high. You know, when we put John Glenn on board a rocket, he was flying the sixth Atlas and two of the previous five had blown up. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis and you're listening to episode 30 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Godspeed John Glenn, Mercury Atlas 6, Friendship 7. After the successful completion of the Mercury Atlas 5 flight that carried Enos the chimpanzee, a press conference was held in early December 1961. Reporters asked NASA's Robert Gilruth who would be the first astronaut in orbit, piloting the Mercury 6. Gilruth then announced the team members for the next two missions. John H. Glenn was selected as prime pilot for the first mission, Mercury 6, with Scott Carpenter as his backup. Donald K. Slayton and Walter Sherall were pilot and backup, respectively, for the second mission, Mercury 7. John Glenn grew up amid the small towns of Ohio, which gave him a strong faith and a sincere commitment to family and country. In an interview... Fifty years after his Friendship 7 mission, Glenn described how his interest in flight began. When I was a kid, there was no such word as astronaut. I thought it'd be great to be a pilot sometime, but I never, we didn't have enough money to take for me to take flight lessons. When I was growing up, my dad, uh, one time we drove by a field where there was a a plane, an old biplane, open cockpit, uh, taking people up for rides. And uh, so my dad and I went up in that airplane, and I was only about eight or nine years old. And uh, I thought that was neat. That was the first time I'd ever been in the air. And to look down on all the houses and the people and cars and things was really something. Before World War II, I was in college by that time, and uh, there was a notice on the physics bulletin board that you could take pilot lessons. The government would pay for them. You'd get your private pilot's license. And it's called Civilian Pilot Training, CPT program. And so that's what I went through and got my private pilot's license in the spring of 41. Glenn came up as a combat pilot in the Marines, flying nearly 60 missions in the Marshall Islands during World War II, then topping that record in Korea. Glenn's background qualified him for training as a test pilot. In 1957, as a project officer on the new F-8U Crusader, he set a record by flying it from Los Angeles to New York in under three and a half hours. He won five distinguished flying crosses and rose to lieutenant colonel. Fifty years later, Glenn reflected on the training he received for his Mercury mission. The mission was planned to come back and land on the water. And so we did a lot of water training on it too. So what would happen if you had a leak in the spacecraft after you once hit the water? Uh, what the impact would be? Uh, uh, if you're underwater, could you get out? We went in the, the pool, turned the spacecraft with us in it. Uh, and it's only a one-person spacecraft at that time. But they turned the thing upside down, then you had to escape from, get out underwater and come up. And training like that, that tried to train for every possible contingency. But what if you had to land in the outback in Australia, which is one of the places where we went up over the, over one of the tracks of the uh, spacecraft, uh, or across the... Uh, jungle area of Papua New Guinea, for instance, or uh, Southwest Africa, Namibia, in that area. We trained for all of that, too, with desert training, where we were, went out, were isolated in the desert, and how you would survive uh, for several days before they could pick you up. Trained in jungle training, went down in Panama or, and Colombia, uh, and went in the high canopy jungle and survived for three days. And uh, so we did a lot of training that way so that if you, could, you ever, it was never necessary to come back to Earth on an emergency landing, uh, that you'd be able to survive whatever the conditions were, whether you came down the jungle or the desert uh, or the land someplace. At this time, the effects of orbital spaceflight on humans was unknown, except to the Soviets. They unfortunately refused to share data and observations made by their cosmonauts. Here's Glenn describing the political situation of 1962. Both we and the, and the Soviets at that time were using boosters that had been designed as ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, 
for the launch of nuclear weapons around the, whatever the target might be. Well, then when it came time to put a man into space, we didn't have a, a separate booster designed just to do that. We used the ICBMs that had been used for a different purpose. We were behind in the manned space program as far as ability to lift weight because we had been better than they were technically. We had been able to make small nuclear weapons, lighter nuclear weapons, and they had to design a booster for their great big uh, Hiroshima-type weapons. Uh, and so here when they used that booster for a space program, they could put up a huge amount of weight where we couldn't. Ours were smaller boosters because we had miniaturized nuclear weapons. The Mercury 6 launch vehicle and Atlas missile number 109D arrived at Cape Canaveral on November 30, 1961. The Mercury capsule number 13 began taking form on McDonald's St. Louis, Missouri assembly line in May of 1960. It was chosen for the Mercury 6 mission in October 1960 and delivered to the Cape on August 27, 1961. The launch was originally scheduled for December of 1961. NASA had hoped to launch Mercury 6 in the same calendar year as the Soviets' Vostok 1, but by early December it was apparent that the mission hardware would not be ready for launch until early 1962. The flight was rescheduled for January 13th, but there were problems with the Atlas rocket's fuel tanks. The launch was then postponed to January 20th. Then the launch slipped day by day to January 27th due to inclement weather. On January 27th, John Glenn was on board Mercury 6 and ready to launch when at T-29 minutes the flight director called off the launch because of heavy overcast. The cloud cover would have prevented the necessary photo coverage of the launch. Television crews were already set to broadcast from both the launch site and Glenn's home, where his wife, Annie, and children were anxiously watching. When the mission was scrubbed, the reporters, accompanied by Vice President Johnson, tried to gain access to Glenn's home in hopes of interviewing his wife. Annie refused, and when John heard about the pressure put on his wife, he backed her up. With all the delays, even the President had to make a comment. Well, it is unfortunate. I know it's strange, Colonel Glenn. It uh, has delayed our program. It uh, puts burdens on all those who must make these decisions uh, as to whether the mission should go or not. I, I think it's been uh, very uh, unfortunate. But uh, I have taken the position that there, the judgment of those on the spot uh, should uh, be final in regard to this uh, mission, and uh, I'll continue to take that judgment. The launch was postponed until February 1st, 1962, but when technicians began to fuel the Atlas on January 30th, they discovered a fuel leak had soaked an internal insulation blanket between the fuel and the oxidizer tanks. This caused a two-week delay while necessary repairs were made. On February 14th, the launch was again postponed due to weather, and finally on February 18th, the weather started to break. It appeared that February 20th, would be a favorable day to attempt a launch. The countdown began at T-390 minutes by installing and connecting the escape rocket igniter. The service structure was then cleared and the spacecraft was powered to verify no inadvertent pyrotechnic ignition. At T-250 minutes, the personnel returned to the service structure to prepare for static firing of the reaction control system. At T-120, the spacecraft was prepared for boarding. Then, at 11.03 Universal Time, John Glenn boarded Friendship 7. The hatch was put into place at T-90 minutes. During installation, a bolt was broken, and the hatch had to be removed to replace the bolt, causing a 40-minute hold. From T-90 to T-55, Final mechanical work and spacecraft checks were made and the service was evacuated and moved away from the launch vehicle. At T-45 minutes, a 15-minute hold was required to add fuel to the launch vehicle and at T-22 minutes, an additional 25 minutes was required for filling the liquid oxygen tanks as a result of a minor malfunction in the ground support equipment used to pump 
liquid oxygen into the launch vehicle. At approximately T-35 minutes, filling of the liquid oxygen tanks began and final spacecraft and launch vehicle checks were made. from Mercury Control. This is Walter Cronkite back at the CBS News Control Center at Cape Canaveral. Fifteen minutes to go before blast off for John Glenn. And the weather is perfect here at Cape Canaveral. A wind of around 15 knots, which is just about uh, maximum for a permissible safe flight. But uh, that doesn't seem to be giving anybody any worries. There are no clouds in the sky at all at this time from horizon to horizon here at Cape Canaveral. And the report from the recovery areas at sea is that the seas are gentle, the winds are gentle, and the skies are clear. Barring most unforeseen circumstances now, it seems that John Glenn will get his much-delayed flight into space and three times around this Earth of ours in the next 15 minutes. At T-10 minutes, the Mercury capsule went on internal power. At T minus 6 minutes 30 seconds, a 2 minute hold was required to make a quick check of the network computer at Bermuda. At T minus 3 minutes, the Atlas launch vehicle went on internal power. At T minus 35 seconds, the spacecraft umbilical cord was ejected. And at 1447 UTC, after 2 hours and 17 minutes of holds and 3 hours and 44 minutes, after Glenn entered Friendship 7, engineer T.J. O'Malley pressed the button in the blockhouse launching the spacecraft. This is how it sounded. Godspeed, John Glenn. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. Loud and clear. Roger, we're programming and roll okay. Scott Carpenter was the voice of Mission Control. This is how he remembered it. Godspeed, John Glenn. I was in the Black House when he was and last to speak to him before liftoff. Gus and Al had both done that, but they were riding on this big, big fuel tank that had enough, had the ability to give him more speed than what Al and Gus had had. They didn't have enough to coast all the way around the world. They just had enough to go up a little ways and fall back to Earth. And this is how John Glenn remembered it 50 years later. People look at all this fire and smoke on the ground and they think you're under huge stress inside. You're not. Uh, the thrust is just barely greater than the weight of the spacecraft, so you lift off very gently. And the more the fuel burns out there, the lighter it becomes, and the thrust is still high. So the farther you go up here on this entry into space, the more, the more G's you feel inside. 30 seconds after liftoff, the General Electric Burroughs Design Guidance System locked onto a radio transponder in the booster to guide the vehicle to orbit. As the Atlas and Friendship 7 passed through Max Q, Glenn reported, quote, It's a little bumpy about here, end quote. After Max Q, the flight smoothed out. At 2 minutes 14 seconds after launch, the booster engines cut off and dropped away. Then at 2 minutes and 24 seconds, the escape tower was jettisoned right on schedule. After the tower was jettisoned, the Atlas and spacecraft pitched over, giving Glenn his first view of the horizon. He described the view as a beautiful sight looking eastward across the Atlantic. Vibration increased as the last of the fuel supply was used up. At the sustainer engine cutoff, it was found that Atlas had accelerated the capsule to a speed only 7 feet per second below nominal. At 1452 UTC, Friendship 7 was in orbit. Glenn received word that the Atlas had boosted Mercury 7 into a trajectory that would stay up for at least seven orbits. Meanwhile, computers at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland indicated that Mercury 6's orbital parameters appeared good enough for almost 100 orbits. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. 
Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, turn around, they started. Roger, capsule turning around, and I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Roger, seven, you have a go with at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. When the posi-grade rockets fired and separated the capsule from the booster, the five-second rate dampening operation started two and a half seconds late. This caused a substantial roll error as the capsule began its turnaround. The automatic attitude control system took 38 seconds to place Friendship 7 into its proper orbital attitude. The turnaround maneuver used 5.4 pounds of fuel from a total supply of 60.4 pounds. The spacecraft then settled into orbit with a velocity of 17,544 miles per hour. This is how Glenn remembered it. When I was inserted into orbit, the first thing it did was uh, the, the spacecraft turned around. So the heat shield was forward in the direction that I was going. That was for protection. And uh, I could look back across uh, northern Florida and uh, clear back along the Gulf Coast. And it was a beautiful view and uh, quite impressive, too. First time I'd ever seen anything from that kind of altitude, for sure. And then you're going almost five miles a second to stay up there in orbit which takes you around the Earth uh, in about an hour and 29 minutes, about every hour and a half uh, you're going around the Earth. So it's, you have uh, very short days and short nights, about 45 minutes each. Here on Earth, you look at a sunset or sunrise, you see the oranges and, and uh, yellows and, and reds, uh, but you don't see the other end of the spectrum. Uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right across the spectrum. And that uh, blue indigo violet, you see that kind of luminous, luminous uh, quality in the color just at sunset and sunrise in space. So it makes it different than anything you've seen here. Friendship 7 began its first orbit with all systems go. It crossed the Atlantic and passed over the Canary Islands. Controllers there reported all capsule systems in perfect working order. Looking at the African coastline and later the interior over Kano, Nigeria, Glenn told the tracking team that he could see a dust storm. Kano Flight Communications replied that the wind had been quite heavy for the past week. Over Kano, Glenn took control of the spacecraft and started a major yaw adjustment. He allowed the spacecraft to continue the yaw maneuver until it was facing into its flight path. Glenn noticed that the attitude indicators disagreed with what he observed were the true spacecraft attitudes. Even with the incorrect instrument readouts, he was pleased to be facing forward instead of backward on his orbital path. Over the Indian Ocean, Glenn observed his first sunset from orbit. He described the moment of twilight as beautiful. The sky in space was very black, he said, with a thin band of blue along the horizon. Clouds prevented him from seeing a mortar flare fired by the Indian Ocean tracking ship as part of a pilot observation experiment. Continuing his journey on the night side of Earth, nearing the Australian coastline, Glenn made star, weather, and landmark observations. The spacecraft came into radio range of Muchia, Australia. At the Mercury tracking station there, Gordon Cooper was the capsule communicator. Glenn reported that he felt fine and had no problems. He saw a very bright light in what appeared to be the outline of a city. Cooper said he probably was looking at the lights of Perth and its satellite town of Rockingham. Uh, Roger, the lights show up very well. And I'll thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Sure well, John. Oh, well, hey, over. Uh, Roger, how you doing, Gordo? We're doing real fine up here. Everything is going great. Mercury 6 moved across Australia and across the Pacific to Canton Island. Glenn experienced a short 45-minute night and prepared the periscope for viewing his first sunrise from orbit. As the sun rose over the island, he saw thousands of little specks, brilliant specks, floating around outside the capsule. He momentarily felt that the spacecraft was tumbling or that he was looking into a star field. 
A quick hard look out of the spacecraft window corrected the illusion, and Glenn was sure that the fireflies, as he called them, were streaming past his spacecraft from ahead. They seemed to flow by slowly, but did not seem to be coming from any part of the spacecraft, and they disappeared as Friendship 7 moved into brighter sunlight. This is how Glenn described it. Uh, this is Friendship 7, and I'll try to describe what I'm in here. Uh, I am in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around the little, they're coming by the capsule, uh, and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. Uh, they, do, they do have a different motion, though, from me, uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. Obviously, NASA was a little surprised about the fireflies. The scientists feared it was a malfunctioning part of the space capsule, though some thought Glenn's vision was caused by a medical condition he encountered while in space, while others tried to find a more spiritual meaning to the celestial fireflies. Glenn tried banging on the capsule walls to see if he could make them move, and he could. The mystery was solved later that year when Scott Carpenter made his orbital flight aboard Aurora 7. Carpenter also reported seeing the particles, and to him, they looked like snowflakes. It turned out Carpenter was pretty close to the truth. They were indeed bits of frozen condensation on the capsule's exterior that broke off as it moved through areas of varying temperatures. But, 50 years later... Glenn still has questions. Uh, I don't know that anybody ever fully explained why the luminous color, though, right at sunrise, as the first light of sun came on the little particles, because that, that was the strange part of it. But uh, that was very surprising, and it didn't pose any danger, but uh, it was there at each sunrise. As the spacecraft crossed the Kauai Hawaii tracking station, Glenn noticed a lot of interference on the high-frequency radio band. As he crossed the Pacific coast of North America, the tracking station at Guaymas, Mexico, informed Mercury Control in Florida that a yaw thruster was causing attitude control problems. Glenn noticed the control problems when the automatic stabilization and control system allowed the spacecraft to drift about a degree and a half per second to the right. Glenn switched control to manual proportional control mode and moved Friendship 7 back to the proper attitude. He tried different control modes to see which used the least fuel to maintain attitude. The manual fly-by-wire combination used the least fuel. After about 20 minutes, the yaw thruster began working again and Glenn switched back to the automatic control system. It only worked for a short time and then began having problems again, this time with the opposite yaw thruster. He then switched back to the manual fly-by-wire system and flew the spacecraft in that mode for the remainder of the flight. As Friendship 7 crossed Cape Canaveral at the start of its second orbit, a flight controller noticed that a sensor called Segment 51 that provided data on the spacecraft landing system was giving a strange reading. The sensor reading indicated that the heat shield and landing bag were no longer locked in position. If this were the case, the heat shield was only being held against the spacecraft by the straps of the retro package. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.